Good morning, everyone. For, welcome to uh, Bridgeport Chapel. And if we can find a place to sit, we'll get going here. I want to begin the, the morning worship service with a question. How many of us here experienced no electricity yesterday? You know, the, the lights went out. And you know, when the lights go out, well, the first thing I think about is, well, we, we've had a loss of power. And guess what that does? That puts us into a state of darkness if it goes into the evening hours, does it not? But with that being said, then we start to think, well, when will the power ever come back on? And we long for that power to come back on. Now, in Scripture, it tells us that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And I would hope, and, and, and my prayer for each and every one of us here this morning is that I really pray and hope we're not walking in darkness but we long for the power to come back on, which is, can only be found in Christ our Savior. And that the lights will come on and he'll be a lamp unto our feet so we know where to go in this life that we now live. So I'm glad that the power is back on and here we are. And you know what? Even if the power wasn't on, I think we should show up anyway. But there you go. But welcome this morning. Uh, if you are visiting, we have visitor cards in the pews. We would love for you to sign those and drop them in the offering plate when it comes by later. And so welcome again. Uh, for uh, I, I'm thrilled to see each and every one of you here this morning. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, again, we are here. And Father, we thank you for the mercies and the grace that you give us on a daily basis. And Lord, as we are gathered here to worship and to have fellowship around the power of your word, we would just ask that, Lord, again, that we would, in our relationship with you through the indwelling presence of your spirit, that we would have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to apply it to our lives and to others. So I thank you again for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, and only in his name. Amen. With that being said, we're going to do some singing, and we're going to, uh, first of all, start out with hymn number 444. I love to tell the story. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, and 4. Please stand. I love Yes. 
436 freely freely seated but we will sing on 502 my heart the rings a melody I have a song Thank you. 
I've been having a little bit of fun with that chorus, and I just might drag it out a little bit longer this last time. So, so good luck with that, Chris, okay? Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Third verse. Twill be my endless theme in glory. With the angels I will sing. Will be a song with glorious harmony. When the chords of heaven ring. Okay, watch it. Here we go. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. I know I'm in trouble when I look over at Chris and she's going like this. <laughs> well, it's not the first time and it won't be the last. Okay, thank you for your singing. I love it how you sing here. It's wonderful. Because of yesterday's experience without having any power and stuff, um, my day and Chris's day, it just didn't go the way that we thought it was going to go and things like that, and uh, so, you know, it, it just makes me understand that, you know, who's in control, and I have my thoughts, but the Lord has his thoughts that are much more important, and I'm going to do a little bit of a tradition this morning, if you would allow me. Way back when, when I was growing up in Kansas, uh, my, the first pastor that I knew as a young child, his name was Pastor Harris Waltner, and he would always start the worship service, and I'm going to end it a certain way too, but he would always start with this uh, verse from the book of Psalms. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And he would always start the service that way. And for some reason, the Lord just laid on my heart just to remember Harris and the testimony that he meant to me as a young child. I tell you what, people, Christ is so good, and he is so caring. Okay, I'd like to call the ushers up at this time and order us to give our morning offering. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your daily blessings to us, how you provide for us on each and every day, whether we recognize it or not. Your loving hand is always there for us. So, Lord, what you have given to us, Lord, again, may we be good stewards of all that you give us, and may we share it with others, not only in, in our offerings that we give back, but how we treat other people also in our daily relationships with them. So we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.
you may remain seated and we're going to sing hymn number 185, a very familiar hymn, but I think it needs to be sung more often just to remind us, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. stand and we'll remain standing for the scripture reading but I want to try I'm not sure if you know this uh, this praise song or not I heard it a few months back and I just fell in love with it it's a very simple melody and uh, just simply give me Jesus In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me And when I'm all alone, oh, when I am alone, and when I am alone, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have.
our scripture reading this morning, you will find it in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I'll be reading verses 6 to 14. 6 to 14. And Paul is addressing the church, and uh, he's talking about liberty and liberty to do uh, many different things. Or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? Now, I am not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope, and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we should reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we do not use this right, but we endure all things, that we may cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share with this altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. You may be seated. Arnie. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> Good morning. I did. I found my water, Jonathan. But, but we'll have more water. My wife is always telling me to drink my water. So this morning I wanted to talk about a subject that we don't talk about that much, but it's a really important topic. The Bible talks more about money than just about any other subject, and we really need to be familiar with what the Bible says about money and about our stewardship over it, our responsibility to manage it. Um, and so I, I, I'm excited to talk about that this morning, um, but I, I guess I need to apologize in advance. I usually, when I preach or teach, I, I like to have a central passage that everything's tied to, and then as we go through that passage, you don't get lost, and you kind of know where we are. And that's a little more difficult today, and so I hope you'll forgive me if I sort of ramble as we go through a number of scriptures, because in dealing with, scripture, with giving and money, there's a lot of scripture that relates to that. So, there... Um, a few significant questions that I think that we ask. Hopefully we know the answers to some of those, but questions like, why should I give? What reasons does God have for us to give? How much does God expect me to give? Or is tithing still for today in this new covenant? Or also, who should I give to? What, a, what should my giving priorities be as I give? Who should 
I give to? Would that be just limited to the local church or, or who? So I want to just look today, what does the Bible say about giving? And first, I think we need to go back a little in history and look at uh, Mosaic Law and in the beginning. And actually, even before Mosaic Law, in Genesis 14, we, we read of Abraham. And Abraham went out in Genesis 14. He rescued Lot, um, who had been captured by some kings. There was a battle that had taken place. And he went and rescued him, and he defeated the kings who had captured Lot and several kings that were with Lot, the king of Sodom and king of Gomorrah. He, um, he then, after capturing all, recapturing Lot and all of the goods that had been taken, he then met a man named Melchizedek, and Melchizedek came out of his city, of the city of Salem, and he blessed Abraham, and Abraham gave him a tithe, or he gave him a tenth of all of the spoils. And that was kind of a, a foreshadowing of Mosaic law. Later, a little bit later then with Moses, actually 400 years later, uh, we read in Leviticus uh, chapter 27. Let me read that. In verse, starting in verse 30, every tithe of the land whether of, of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, it's the Lord's, and it's holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he shall add a fifth to it. And every tithe, and every tithe of herds and flocks, every tenth, of, tenth animal that passes under the herdsman's staff, the animal shall be holy to the Lord. And so with the Israelites under Mosaic law, they were to give a tenth of their flocks, of their uh, crops, uh, of everything that they produced. A tenth of it belonged to the Lord. Um, and in fact, the word today, tithe, comes from a Hebrew word that means one-tenth. And so when we talk about that word tithing, it means giving a tenth. Um, it's also kind of important, I think, to understand in the whole tithing or in the Mosaic Law giving of a tenth, what, what was done with that money or, or that wealth. And we read about that a little bit in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 28 and 29, where it says, At the time of every three years you shall bring the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up, within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your town shall come and eat and be filled that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. And so the purpose of the tithe was to first provide for the Levites who didn't have any land and they were the clergy, the people who took care of all the things that happened in the temple for temple worship. But also, for he said, for show, sojourners, sounds like homeless people, people who had nothing who were traveling through, for widows and the fatherless, orphans, all were to be provided for by the tithe that they were to bring. And so God had that specific purpose. Um, that does bring the question then, today is a new day, a, a new covenant. We don't have a temple anymore. Do we still tithe? Do we still need to give 10%? What does scripture say about that? And, and actually the New Testament doesn't say tithe. It doesn't use the word. Um, well, it does refer back to Mosaic, Mosaic Law on a couple of occasions. In fact, uh, we just heard from J.D. He just read, it mentioned that. Um, but, but it's different today. How much, and it leaves plenty of questions then. 
such as how much should we give? Or does the Lord command us to give today? Let's, let me just start uh, with Galatians 6.6 6 in terms of are we commanded to give. In Galatians 6.6 6 it says, Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. And so do we still have clergy today? Of course we do. Do we still have people whose occupation is to do the work of God? Yes, we do. Um, and it's then our obligation to share with them. And so, yes, we are commanded to give. And we'll talk a little bit later about seven principles of giving, but I want to just start by talking about some principles. Um, and, and let me just start coming back to tithing, um, the idea of tithing. One of the dangers of tithing is, for us, is that if we were to give 10% to, the, to God's work, what do we then think about the remaining 90%? And the danger is, it's mine. <laughs> um, but it's not, is it? The, it's all God's, it all comes from him. We see that abundantly in scripture. And, and we need to guard ourselves against giving, when, when we have a number, this is how much you have to give, then we begin to think a little bit legalistically, which is a danger to us. But we must remember that it's all God's. God has given everything we possess. And, and we should be then, in response, grateful to him. Um, And, and a, a, another slight problem with tithing is it causes us to wonder, we kind of wrangle with, well, 10% of what? 10% of my gross income? 10% of my net income? 10% um, after my deductions? Um, but what does Scripture say? What, is, what does God want from us? Well, we're to, dis, to decide in our hearts and Scripture says we're not to give under compulsion, not reluctantly, but our giving should flow out of relationship with God, out of gratitude to God. And so we should be excited to give, and we'll come back and talk, talk about that a little bit later, but giving is a privilege, um, and it's a part of our worship. Um, Sometimes as we approach the idea of giving too, uh, again, we, we think a lot about amount. God, how much do you want me to give? And I think sometimes we ask the wrong questions in doing that. A good example of that we find in, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, in that story, there's not much giving, but... In brief, Jesus tells the, the parable in response to, you know, he's talking about loving your neighbor, and, and so a lawyer asks him, and who is my neighbor? And so Jesus tells the parable to answer that question. And of course, if you remember the parable, uh, it, there's uh, a man is traveling uh, on business, and he encounters robbers on the, on the road, and they beat him up and rob him and leave him half dead on the side of the road. And then in the parable, three men come past, first a priest and then a Levite, who are the religious people, and they walk by on the other side of the road, um, not wanting to be bothered. And finally, a Samaritan, and you remember a Samaritan is uh, a half-breed, disrespected, uh, nearly an enemy to, Israelite, or to the Jews, not the Israelites, um, and he stops, and he cares for the person, and brings him to the inn and on, his, on his animal, and he pays the innkeeper to take care of him, and he takes care of him. And then Jesus, at the end of the parable, asks the lawyer, um, who, which of the three proved to be a neighbor? And of course, they answered the 
the third one, the last one. And, and then Jesus said, go and do the same. But if you look at that passage, the, the question that Jesus was act, asked is, and who is my neighbor? And why did they ask that question? Well, because that then I know who I have to love and who I don't have to love. Um, who is my neighbor? But Jesus didn't answer that question, did he? He instead asked another question, who proved to be a neighbor? And then he said, go and do the same. And I think as we look at giving, it's much the same. We ask, how much do I need to give, God? And perhaps Jesus would say to us, go and be a giver. Go and look for opportunities to give. And, and that is true about God. He's concerned not about as much what we do, but as to who we are and our lifestyle and our hearts. And I think that as we approach the subject of giving, God wants us to be people who are givers. That that's the desire and inclination of our hearts. Having said all that regarding tithing, it also, tithing is, there's a few benefits to that. It's a good starting place for giving, actually. Um, it helps us not to forget to give. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I forgot to bring a check to put in the offering at church. We wanted, to, planned to do it, but didn't get around to it. And we do forget a lot. And the idea of tithing reminds us if that becomes our habit, and that's a good thing. Um, it also maybe can help us in a way of not being driven or not responding because of our emotions. Um, it's good that when we give that we're purposeful and we have a plan uh, and, and God will give us opportunities to give along the way. But tithing isn't bad as a starting place and a guide. But I think that we have to be careful and we want to be people who are givers. Let me just, uh, I, I want to talk about some principles. Let me start by some overall perspectives that we need to have in terms of giving. Um, first, we're stewards. Again, we talked about that. It's, it's not my stuff, but everything we have comes from him, and we're his stewards, and the th resources that we have have been entrusted to us by God, everything. If we read um, Luke Chapter 16, verses 10 to 13. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If you have, have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. He either will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. And so as stewards, it uses the word faithful. We need to be faithful stewards with God's resources. Um, and that's God's expectation of us. And so if I have lots of money, what does that mean? I have a stewardship entrusted to me, and I'm responsible for that. And, and actually being wealthy bears a little bit of responsibility. And if I'm faithful in, in much, or faithful in little, God knows I'll be faithful in much. And I think that that talks about how much will God entrust to us? If I'm not faithful, will he give me more? I doubt it. And then the last sentence talks about we can't serve two masters, the last verse. You cannot serve God in money. And in our stewardship, we have to make a determination. What are we living for? What's our purpose? Are we going to live for wealth, accumulating wealth? Are we going to live for God and his purposes? If God is our master, 
then he would have us use our money for his purposes. Similarly, in, in Matthew 25, I won't go there, but we have the parable of the talents. And it, similarly, there's a stewardship entrusted. Remember, the master goes away on a journey and he entrusts his wealth to several of his servants to invest it. And when he returns, the servants have to give account of what they did with the money. And one day, where our master will return and we'll have to give account for what we've done with the resources that he's entrusted to us. Um, and his response to several of the student, student <laughs> servants was, well done, good and faithful servant. And hopefully, one day on our master's return, we also will hear that statement. The other statement made was, well, it wasn't a statement as much. It was a statement made to his ser other servants. Take that servant and bind him and cast him into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I know that we don't want to hear that statement. Uh, but our stewardship is important. And, and it, that's kind of a warning to us. Um, We're stewards. Whether we like it or not, we're stewards. The second perspective that we should have as we think about giving is that there are dangers associated with wealth. Wealth can be dangerous. We, we think of wealth rather positively, um, but wealth can be dangerous to us. Remember 1 Timothy 6.10, simple statement, he, he writes, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. And wealth can be a danger to us. It can be destructive to our faith. If I lose my focus and focus on that. Or similarly, in Luke 12, verses 16 to 21, Jesus tells them a parable. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This night your soul was required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And again, it seems that there's two options there. I either lay up treasure for myself, or I'm rich towards God. Is there, any, is there a problem with Having big barns? <laughs> of course not. The problem was that in the parable, this farmer was focused on wealth. And he was focused on storing up, laying up more and more wealth. And so wealth captures our attention, captures his attention. And of course, it's not. Our life. It's not what our life is composed of, and it doesn't give life. Um, and we have to be careful about that, that we don't decide that we want to lay up and store up more and more and more money because we're stewards. It's not our money. Jesus, remember, Jesus said, very simply talking to his disciples, he says, how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's more difficult, it's, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Um, and they were shocked, and, but Jesus said, but all things are possible with God. But, but if we're wealthy, it's a danger. Wealth is a danger to us, and we have to be careful because we're stewards. The last principle 
that we need to think about, I think, and just, again, when we talk about wealth and think about wealth, is that there is also great blessing in giving. And Scripture's full of that, where God bestows blessing on those who are generous. In Acts 20, 35, Jesus makes the statement, um, well, um, Paul is talking, and he, but he quotes Jesus. He says, in all these things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, um, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I'm um, in Jesus' statement, it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's blessing in giving. Um, and, and I guess in thinking about that, do we pray more often to receive? God, God give me, give me. Or do we pray more often for opportunities to give? What's the inclination of our heart? Wonderful passage in, in, in the Old Testament, one of the prophets, Malachi. Malachi 3.10 says, and, and it's his first, he warns them and says, stop robbing me. But he says, bring the full tithe into the warehouse, storehouse so that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need, until there's no more room, some translations say. Um, and when we, it says, faithfully give to God, what does he say he will do? He will pour blessing into our lives. In fact, not just a little. He will pour blessing until there's no room to receive it. Until you don't know what to do with it. Later we read that, that there's a purpose for that. Um, Proverbs also says that, Proverbs uh, 11, 24 and 25. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. I like that picture, that, that God will enrich us if we give, and the one who waters will be watered. Um, picture that. In a dry land, that's, that's a blessing too. Um, there is blessing. God blesses us if we give. 1 Corinthians 9-11, there's specific um, I lost that one. Hmm. Um, there's specific promise and a specific purpose for that. Sorry, 2 Corinthians 9.11. It's in there. It says, you will be enriched in everything for all liberality which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. And it goes on to say in verse 12, for the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. And so when God pours out blessing, it supplies the needs of the saints. When God pours out blessing, it allows me to give. And I think that's a wonderful thought when God gives to us, when God blesses us, it allows me to give. And that's really his purpose. But there's great blessing when we give. So those three, there's those three, um, I think, perspectives for us to hold on to. We're stewards, wealth can be dangerous, and God has great blessing for us. Let me... Um, then I just want to talk about seven principles of giving, which really talk about, well, then how should we give? How should we give? First principle, giving should be a priority. 
Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and, there, and your vats will be bursting with wine. Again, there's blessing, but it says honor the Lord with the first fruits of your produce. And first fruits, what does that mean? If, if you give God the beginning, the first things that come, there's two things about that. One is, the, if you've ever had a garden, the, the, first, the first of the crop, the first of the vegetables that come are generally the best. They seem to be the freshest. And, and the principle is that we're to give God our best. And the second part about that in giving our first fruits is, do we do it first or do we do it last? Do we give him from the beginning or do we wait to see what's left? And we're told to give him our first fruits. And so when we give, we should give at the beginning. When I'm paid, when I get my paycheck, should I wait till the end of the month and see if there's any left and then give to God? No, give the first fruits. It's a principle for us, significant. Second principle, giving should be proportionate to our earnings. And again, that's a starting point. That's a general statement. We're always free to give more and God's pleased when we sacrifice. First Corinthians 16, one and two, it says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there, so that there will be no collecting when I come. Um, and so it goes on. Uh, it says in the second verse, to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there'll be no collecting. And and so as God blesses us, as we have uh, wealth available, as we have finances available, we should give from that. And if we have more finances, more wealth avail available, we should give more as God prospers us. Um, and that's consistent with what God did with tithing. You gave 10% under Mosaic law. Three, which follows closely after the second principle, is our giving should be sacrificial. And that goes a little bit more than my means, doesn't it? And some of us might not like this because we would rather that our giving be comfortable. Um, but God is pleased when we give more than we are confident that we that will you know will I make it through the month? And there are of course many examples in scriptures of that. King David understood that. Remember, he was he had gone out to make an offering. God had sent him out to make an offering, and when he got there, the, there was a farmer owning the land in the place where he was to do it, and he offered, oh no, he said, Let me, I'll give you everything you need for the offering. But King David said, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. And our offering does cost us. And it should be a sacrifice. Um, in Luke 21, 1 to 4, remember the story of the poor widow who put in two small copper coins? It said, let me just read that passage. Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. And when we sacrifice, God notices. Jesus immediately noticed. And what, what's entailed when you sacrifice? If you give more than you think you can afford, 
what are you doing? What's happening? You're giving in faith. When you give more than you can afford, when you give more than, you're not sure where things are going to come, you see a need and you give, you're giving in faith, right? You're believing that God will provide. In fact, God does bless, it says, when we give. And so giving sacrificially is giving in faith. And God calls us to give in faith, to trust him. To trust him not only in other areas of life, but especially trust him in our finances. The fourth principle, giving um, has proportionate results in the sense that when we give, God responds to that proportionately. We should give generously, and then it says God will give, re, re, return that to us. In, in Luke 6.38, it says, Give, and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and it will, and it will be put into your lap. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. He says, give, and it will be given back to you abundantly, pressed down, running over. Give, and um, the measure that you, the amount that you give, how much that you give will be the amount, the measure that it all comes back to you. So if you give a little, God will give you only a little back. If you give a lot, God will give you a lot back, it says. Um, a lot of scripture like that, that talks about that. Um, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And so again, what I put in, how much I give, how much I respond to God is how much he responds to me and how much blessing I receive back. Um, I, I like the statement listening to some of D. Duke's teaching. He was talking about when we plant one seed, how much will we get? Maximum one plant, right? If I plant five seeds, Maybe five plants. And it's pretty simple. The math is simple. How much you sow, farmer talk, is what you'll reap. That's pretty important. If we give generously, it gives God opportunity to give to us. Um, and I think that, that, that measure of faith, if you think about it, would a farmer sow generously unless he expected a, a bountiful crop? Would a farmer sow many seeds if he didn't expect something back? Of course not, he wouldn't. And we need to have that expectation in our giving. I, I like the statement um, Charles Swindoll says, that giving is a process of growing and learning, learning to trust God as we give. And it really is a process. As I give, I have the opportunity to experience God giving back, bless, pouring blessing into my life. And it's a process of learning. The process doesn't start until I give. <laughs> Uh, number five, giving should be done cheerfully. You know, no one wants to receive a gift from a begrudging giver, and God doesn't want gifts from grumpy givers. <laughs> Second Corinthians 9, 7 continues from 9, 6. Each one must give as he is decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We should make a decision, decide in my heart what God's calling me to give, 
And then I should do that with cheerfulness, with joy. I need to make a decision that that's what I want to do. And honestly, if I don't want to do it, maybe God doesn't even want it. But we're called to be cheerful givers, not reluctant, begrudging givers. Um, Hebrews 12.2 was an interesting statement. Jesus' example, remember in 12.1 it talks about, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race that is marked out for us. In Hebrews 12.2 it goes on, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. And you have to wonder, you know, as he faced the cross, what was the joy set before him as he gave his life? Well, he was thinking about um, what he had set out to do, which was to bring humanity back to God and to restore relationship for us with God, to bring eternal life to his bride, the church. For the joy set before him. And as Jesus as an example, when Jesus gave his life, when he gave, he did it with joy, with purpose. And it wasn't grudging. So it's a perfect example for us. As we give, what should we look at? Should we look at our empty wallet? Or should we look at what God's going to do? What are the things that God's going to accomplish for eternity? And that's the purpose, in, that's the focus in our giving. Number six, giving should be done secretly, which maybe that's not the right word, but it should not be done for recognition. Um, and of course, we read about that in Matthew 6, where Jesus is observing uh, Pharisees. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, don't sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they've received their reward, but when they give to the need, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that in your giving it may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And so our giving should be not for recognition. So as so other people see me do it, I need to be careful that I'm doing it to honor God um, and obey God. Last one, number seven. Giving is an expression of worship. Therefore, it's important What's the most important thing that we do? It might be worship. What are you going to do for eternity? Worship. We'll be in the presence of God, enjoying the presence of God for eternity in worship. And giving is a form of worship. In Romans 12.1, familiar verse, we read... Um, I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy to God, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And as I give myself and all my resources to him, that is worship. And we owe God worship, right? He, again, he created us. He, he even owns me. Um, John 12, 1 to 3. Uh, it's only part of the story. As Jesus, before his crucifixion, he's coming out of the city of Jerusalem and he goes to bed. All the crowds are going in and he's going out. And he goes 
to his friend's house, Mary and Martha and Lazarus then Bethany. And the last time that Jesus has been there, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, very emotional, uh, wonderful story. And so now he visits his friends and they prepare dinner for him. And it's a wonderful time. And then it says, let me just read it. Uh, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And they gave a dinner for him there. And Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. Martha therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. It was very costly. It was probably, they weren't wealthy people. That was probably the most costly thing, the most valuable thing that Mary possessed. She might have just sold a lot of things and gone out and bought it for the occasion, I'm not sure. But it was probably the most valuable thing that she had. She poured it on his feet and then she wiped his feet with her hair. I would expect she was probably weeping as she did that, and it was worship. It was worship, giving to Jesus. Why did she do it? Because she loved him. She loved him with all of her heart. She wanted to give. That was the inclination of her heart. And giving should be like that for us. Personal, relational. Why do we give? Not only because I'm obeying God, but because I love him. I want to worship him. We're called to worship him. Uh, as I close, there's kind of one question remaining. Who should we give to? So today, if I'm supposed to give, if I want to give, who should I give? How should I give that money? Well, in Scripture, we're told to give to the poor. We're told to give to God and to his work um, in general. And yet more specifically, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, it says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox when it treads out the grain. The labor deserves his wages. And here that's a New Testament saying, Uh, The elders of the church, if they rule well, they're considered worthy of honor. And then it goes on to say that the the labor, as as those leaders labor among the church people, they're worthy that, that God, that you would give, that material things would be given to support them. The labor deserves his wages. And and J.D. read earlier um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, If we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial uh, offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And that really says that if you, to me, that if you come and you're a part of of a, a specific local body of Christ, a church, and you are blessed there, and God speaks to you and feeds you there, and you grow there, and you're benefited by the teaching and the ministry of that church, then you're obligated to support the ministry that happens there and the staff who are there. It's our obligation to do that. That doesn't mean that we're not also free to give to missionaries and to other ministries. 
But if I am part of a local body and I'm blessed there, I'm obligated to support that. That's how I read that scripture. Um, let me summarize with one last scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 and 18 says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. And I think it sums it up well for us. Three, three statements. Not to set our hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. And secondly, it's a great statement. It says, on God who provides us, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Is it wrong or bad to have riches? No, I'm allowed to enjoy them, right? God gives it, provides us richly with everything to enjoy. And then in the last line, to be generous and ready to share. As God has blessed me and gives me, richly gives me things to enjoy, I still need to be ready to share with others. We should be people who look for opportunities to give and trust God in the process that God will continue to provide so that I can give. How to end that? Um, I think there's a challenge for all of us. You know, am I a good steward of all that God has given and is giving to me? Is that the inclination of your heart? And do you want to respond in worship in that way? And so as we, as we pray together and close, um, just, uh, just want to ask that, that God would move in our hearts with that intention that, that we are a giving church and, and I, I'm grateful and, and I think uh, so many of us here to be commended. But what, what is God speaking to you? Let's pray together. God, we're grateful for your blessing in our lives. Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have to know you and to worship you. And I pray, God, that, that you would enable us to do that richly and, and freely without regret. God, increase our faith. Enable us to be fully faithful to you. I pray, God, that here in this local church, that you would be honored, not only in our interactions with each other, but how we worship you and how we we share all that you've given us and how we're involved in your work and your purposes. God, we declare that we love you. We give you our hearts and our lives and our resources. We pray it in Jesus' name for his honor. Amen. Oh, Andrew Ingstrom, sure. Um, in the bulletin, it mentions a need. Um, he is, Andrew's a very fruitful young man um, with a gospel, and he's, his health is, is really, he's having great difficulty right now. His platelet counts is zero, and his immune system's not working. So let's, we'll just pray about that. Lord, we do thank you for, for Andrew and his ministry, as we have thank you for his father, Tim. And we pray, God, that, that you would heal him and, and strengthen him and restore him. God, thank you for the, the fruitful ministry that he's had. Pray for his family, too, God, that you would give them peace in this time. We just ask, God, for restorations. Heal him of the, heal him his immune system and his, his blood counts. God, thank you that, that you are the healer. Father, thank you that that you're concerned, God, for each of us as individuals. Again, we ask it in the authority and power of Jesus' name. Amen.
on January the 22nd, Silas Stephen Heil was born to Scott and Charlene. Let's welcome him. And you know, our responsibility to young Silas is that he sees Jesus and each and every one of us as he goes along his way, okay? And so uh, that's our responsibility. Let's all stand. We're going to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, a very simple little chorus, and then we'll be dismissed. bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. You are dismissed.